You just created one of the most robust, dramatic, intelligent, very detailed animated series for kids property in the last 25 years, beloved by fans, put up there with shows like Batman, X-Men, Gargoyles. How would you handle the next entry? I'm always pushing for originality over repetition. It's one of the dangers of any sequel. You want to add on, respect, but not repeat. The Legend of Korra tried very hard to be original as possible. And I think that mindset went too far in some places that it hurt the universe, characters, and staples. It's not just from one issue. It's a problem from choices done throughout the series. I experienced Avatar and Korra all at once. I didn't even hear about this show till Korra had recently ended. I just saw lots of people talking about this magic show. At first, I thought they were talking about the blue people avatar stuff. That's how much I didn't know about it. So I was like, everyone says this show's good. I bought all seven seasons to see what's up. The first series was virtually perfect. If I dug through it enough, I know I'd have some issues with it. My favorite part of the series is how unique the powers were done, being able to control natural elements of the planet. Just before you fully understood everything about bending, they would have something up their sleeves to make it more interesting. It drove the excitement of the series. Probably the best part of the show was Zuko, his turn from evil to seeing his horrible past. It was a long, complicated process. The series also dabbed with Aang and Katara going down some roads where you question, would these characters start doing not such good things? And probably everyone's favorite part, the Avatar life cycle, going for thousands of years, hundreds of people. This almost invincible spirit would be reborn. They would be the world's guardians of that era, having vastly different personalities that would come in handy when you needed help. So another thing, Aang, Katara, Zuko, all became these huge characters. How do you do a sequel without them? This was the first area the creators went wrong with. I highly suggest listening to the audio commentaries on the Korra episodes. DiMartino and Kinesco discuss what they wanted to do in Korra in much more detail. The series is not crap, and it's not an issue of Korra not living up to Avatar's high expectations. It's more of the issue that things feel out of place from the original series. The way the story structured, villains were mostly throwaways, Korra having problems being consistent during the series, especially season two, and their heavy reliance with time jumps. We get jarring character development or forced to assume something developed when we didn't see them. One of the biggest changes to the series was the visual difference. The original series took place in a time where they didn't have any forms of technology and were just starting to be able to manufacture metals. Not that I don't believe that this universe could create cars, blimps, or skyscrapers. It's the short time between the first and second series. Internally, the series are just 70 years apart, but the technological jump is more like three or 400 years. It's very jarring. All done so that Korra can be visually different from Avatar. What would it be like to be in a more modern world with people who can do magic, but you can see they didn't want to cut off the show from the original all the way. They wanted to still be able to capitalize on bringing back older characters. This was a mistake. The point of these changes is to bring a sort of refresh, a way for people to get excited again. But they also water down things that did get people excited in the past series. Remember how each bender type has a high bending ability? Water has blood bending, which is illegal. Earth has metal and lava bending, and fire has lightning or combustion bending. Both metal and lightning became commonplace and generic within just 70 years? especially lightning, it turned into making people batteries. That's it. One of the most powerful abilities shown off in the first series relegated to power plants. The Matrix would love them. One thing I never really cared for in any show was the revolving door of villains. It can be beneficial if you get stuck with a lackluster villain. Many people didn't like Amon in the first season of Korra, but because the series is set up to change villains, how do we know this wasn't caused by the rioters needing to wrap up his storyline in 12 episodes? So they didn't want to make him better. Imagine if Zuko was a part of Korra. His journey would have to end at the season one point. No Iroh side stories, no rivalry and hatred towards his father, no final fight between Azula and Zuko. He's just killed on one of the Fire Nation ships. The opposite happens too. Season three's main villains, the Red Lotus group led by Zaheer, they should have been the main villains through the entire show. Thematically, it makes more sense. 
One of Korra's biggest problems was her ability to not properly master airbending. It would have been an interesting double perspective of having your main villain use airbending while Korra struggled with it. The Red Lotus group brought in some potential storylines like Plea and Zaheer's backstories. You could see the writers saw the issues from season one and two, so this time they fleshed out the bad guys. The season finale of three was great because it caused damage to Korra where she didn't know what to do moving forward, similar to when Aang lost his chakra. That plot line alone where Zaheer forced Korra into the Avatar state to get rid of the Avatar line should have been a focal point for the final season. Not half resolved within season three's finale then switching over to the lackluster Kavira plot line three years later. This is why I don't like the time jumps. These jumps are only there to help create the next villain, but doesn't acknowledge that Korra was feeling sorry for herself for three whole years and never got over what happened in the finale till Toph gave her the needed pep talk slash help. I'm all for time jumps because we know what it looks like when you don't do that, but this type of plot line only works if this was a few weeks, maybe a month later, not three years. Just because Korra and Toph's time between each other was enjoyable, I'm not going to sacrifice proper character and story development over nostalgia. That's why switching villains for all four seasons was stupid. If Zaheer or any of the other Lotus rotated in, similar to how Teen Titans focused on a hero each year, you aren't starting from scratch, wasting time introducing us to a new enemy. I easily could see reworking the finale so that Zaheer was recaptured, imprisoned, then have Pli take over as a leader in season four, and when they finally break Zaheer out near the end of the last season, she dies and they do the whole flying stuff. That would have been a better climax than the whole mecha robot thing. I really hated the whole giant robot boss fight in the series finale because of the show making all high powered bending skills so common. I was asking, where are all the people who can do lightning, metal, and lava bend? And we are also dealing with all the new people becoming benders thanks to season two. The city is under direct attack and siege. Evacuate the people who can't bend, then use every single bender to lift buildings and skyscrapers, freeze huge amounts of water from the pipelines, melt every bit of metal and stone around you, and throw countless amounts of lightning at the robot. It's gonna go down. Just because it's made out of a material that can't be grabbed by metal bending and has that super weapon doesn't mean huge impacts can't take it down. Your ammo is literally around it. They didn't even try to clog the weapons nozzle to cause a feedback explosion. Grab something to plug it up. Cover your bodies with metal or stone. Rip the roads right from under it and then dump the suit into the ocean. Toph did amazing earth bending tactics all alone while a police team and a whole city can't help Korra stop a stupid robot. Did the show switch over to M. Night Shyamalan's universe where it took 20 guys to move a pebble? The modern setting also causes problems, like why doesn't firebenders ignite underground gas lines around the robot? Why doesn't Bolin push out the inside of the robot? The inner metal is all stuff he can bend. I can go on forever with how stupid this fight is. The time jumps didn't help here. While I'm okay with Mako, Bolin, and Asami, these characters didn't really gel tightly with Korra compared to the first series. Mako, I thought was gonna be my favorite of the secondary characters, like how my favorite in Avatar was Toph. His background rising up through his life, protecting his brother, all are traits I like watching, but him bouncing between jobs got annoying. Whenever they did time jumps, he would revert back to being a detective. Then when we came back, he rejoined Team Avatar. I hated we couldn't have Mako stay as a cop while working with Team Avatar. Mako couldn't make up his mind where he wanted to go. First he starts out as the pro bending team, then a cop, joins Korra, then a bodyguard, joins Korra again, then finally a cop when the show ends. Dude, you're all over the place. Bolin, the one issue I had, he repeated himself. He didn't really have much to do, so the writers put him in side stories that were tied to the season's plot. Season two, he was involved with that propaganda film for the tribes. Then in season four, he turned on Korra and joined Kavira's side with Opal. How many times does Bolin have to fall for the same mistake? After a while, he stopped feeling like a character and more of a way to bring drama to the team. It never felt right for him to join Kavira, except again, because of the time jump, things between the characters broke down. But because we didn't see important things like this, 
It doesn't work and just comes off as repetitive. Then you have the whole Korra Asami relationship that happens in the last few seconds of the show. Where did that come from? Did all the setup happen in the three year time jump? It just looks like crappy shipping. Stop using time jumps as the get out of jail card. To be fair to the creators, 50% of Korra's whiplash is from the network changing the show from a miniseries, which is what season one intended to be. That's why Korra finally started to get a hold of airbending and becoming a full avatar. It's the ending of her arc and series. Then it getting extended to 26 episodes, which is now season two story. So they had to ignore that first ending and partially reset Korra. Then Nick renewing the show again on short notice for two more seasons when season one was wrapping up. They had to animate 26 episodes in two years. This gives very little time to come up with plot lines and arcs. That's why Spirits feels like a series finale as well. Ending the Avatar state and fighting a dark avatar works better as a series finale, not a midpoint finale. Nickelodeon, why didn't you want to commit to three seasons from the beginning like Avatar when the show was so popular and praised? The biggest mistake has to go to season two and the Avatar line being broken. Season two was pretty boring. It was mostly showing us the problems of the water tribes but it wasn't really interesting. It's the same issue The Phantom Menace had, delving into politics and trade issues. This is how you start episode one? It also made Korra look stupid in so many ways. Quitting Tenzin's training just after you finally started to get the hang of airbending? This is where they abuse time jumps. It's been six months, I'm good with airbending now. Korra, you were having problems with airbending since you were a kid. Then you have Korra reverting back and forth from being the idiot and then being wise. I got whiplash. I didn't hate the premise to give us a full breakdown and backstory to the origin of the Avatar powers, how the world was formed around bending powers and spirits, Avatar 1, the two ancient spirits that were at war who eventually became the good and bad avatars. I really liked them all. But Korra keeps falling for obvious signs she's being used, especially when she never cared about the inner workings of the water tribes. She doesn't stop to think about what she's doing. One way to alleviate the Korra whiplash, instead of having Unalak trick her to open the spirit world, have Vatu be the one breaking down the walls of the spirit world. Rava and Vatu are destined to fight. Why is Unalak really needed to bring in the water tribe material, which wasn't that interesting overall? Changed this to the weakening of the barrier, draws Korra to fight the escaping spirits. And with this, the Red Lotus group hears Vatu. They want these powers destroyed. So Vatu and the Red Lotus both use each other behind their backs. So you have this tension from the release of Vatu mixed in with the Red Lotus for two years. At first, because Zaheer wants the Avatar powers destroyed, Vatu doesn't have the ability to merge with anyone, but combining season three's finale with two's, Zaheer can hypocritically merge with Vatu and become the dark avatar. Please death, him able to master flying and failing to kill Korra with the mercury poison brings him to this edge. And I'm not singling out Korra. Aang did this too, but because Korra's personality is the direct opposite of Aang, rash, impulsive, arrogant, huge ego. She acts like an idiot way more often. It's why people really got mad at her losing all the lives of the past avatars. It was wrong, period, regardless if it had happened to Aang or Korra, the avatar lives are what make the show special. In the commentary, what I got from why the writers did this was basically so that Korra didn't have an out. If Korra could call up Aang for help all the time, there would be no issues. That's kind of wrong though. Just because the audience knows how the powers work and it's not a mystery anymore, that doesn't make the Avatar powers invincible. I remember when Aang found the town where Avatar Kyoshi once protected over. Aang was getting obsessed trying to act like his past life. It failed because Aang isn't Kyoshi. The Avatars are there to help and give guidance, but each life is their own. What works for Roku doesn't work for Aang. Aang has to apply the knowledge and wisdom in his ways for it to work. The same goes for Korra. The writers chose to make Korra use the Avatar state and talking to the past lives much more common. It's the watering down what's special from the show that's the issue here. When they should have these moments sparingly, and I didn't in general have a problem with Korra. She had to be different than Aang. He lived with a lot of different crap. Aang wasn't gonna be the most lively kid out there, but Korra's personality does get on your nerves. 
and they relied a lot on her being dumb. So you have this character that you want to like, but then she does this really stupid thing, it grinds on you, so when Korra released Vatu, followed by him badly injuring Rava, losing 10,000 years of the Avatar state, you broke the camel's back on Korra. It was a line that the show shouldn't have crossed, simply so they didn't have that out, even though they still wrote the show the same way, except using Old Toph to replace Aang, for example. I also have a problem with Rava. Okay, we lost the 10,000 years of the old avatars, but Rava was holding on to these spirits for millenniums. You'd think she'd still remember these people and still confide into Korra of who they were, how they would have responded to her questions. She was basically the computer. The thing I don't get, the show can pick and choose when for Rava to pop up, but not do the same thing with the past lives. They needed to write smarter here. I give them props that they didn't just reverse what they did. They stuck to their guns, even though I really freaking hated it. But they did have a way around this with Rava. I'm glad they didn't make any more shows. There's really nothing else to explore moving forward. The creators pretty much gave us as much as they could without repeating themselves. Now, if they wanted to come back to the universe and did animated series on older past lives, that's cool but nothing forward. I really don't need to see Avatar set in 2022, like if the Avatar is just some high school kid or something. <coughs> if I had a choice, I would have had the Red Lotus as the main villains for the whole series, combining the elements from season one and two into the group. Zaheer wanted to get rid of the Avatar and already aligned with season two, and there's some lines that could link Amon wanting to release Vatu. Just remove Amon and Unalog and merge them into Gazan and Minghua. Zaheer would be released in the season one finale, the other three would be the ones going after Korra. I also think that having the dark avatar for the final season would have been the best way to close the series. Zaheer being a full mirror of Korra, rather than throwing the Vatu plotline away with Unalak, a big missed opportunity. The Legend of Korra is okay, but they tried so hard to be different from Avatar, it blew up in these areas. And I wish they just cut ties from the first series completely. It caused too much of an issue. You want to service the old characters. You don't want them to overshadow the new ones. It's better off to not do it. And keep it for just Aang's spirit. Have 10 other Avatars between Aang and Korra, so when he pops up, it's a special moment.